history of architecture, but my quotes and allusions are never literal. My meanings are always internalized, my metaphors purely architectural. I'm still taken with the poetics of modernism, the beauty and, and utility of technology. My primary ordering principles have to do with a kind of purity that derives in part from the inherent distinction between the man-made and the natural, a distinction that serves to unite the two in a relationship of complementary. I see man's intervention as an aesthetic organization of the environment. I seek to impose a coherent system of mutually dependent values, a harmonious relationship of parts. By this, I mean a resolution of all the interlocking issues of form, function, and fitness. Above all, there has to be a reciprocal involvement between the concept for building and its physical manifestation. As Alberti said, beauty in architecture consists of integrating the proportions of all parts of a building in so precise a way that every part has its absolutely fixed size and shape and nothing can be added or taken away without destroying the harmony of the whole. My rigor also is a search for clarity. This search for me begins with the plan. And I'm sorry, the, the, these slides are a little bit out of order. Uh, uh, the plan, which seems to have been neglected of late, and is, is in fact the key. This two-dimensional image contains within it the instructions for the three-dimensional object that is the building. Together with the section, it generates the building. While the ele elevation tends to pictorialize, the plan and section speak to the architect about spatial ideas. But the plan is the most convincing and fundamental expression of architectural ideas. I do believe that buildings should speak. In my work, the use of specific and internally consistent vocabulary of elements and certain themes over the years has allowed me, one might say, a coherent and evolutionary means of expression. But if my vocabulary has to some degree remained unchanged, the process by which I manipulate and assemble this vocabulary has become more complex and comprehensive. Uh, you might think of it as an intellectual progression, which has, in fact, coincided with the growing scope and, and in fact, the growing complexity uh, of some more recent commissions. At the beginning, the design of a number of private houses, which I've been showing you here, has provided me with a fine opportunity to develop my ideas about architecture. Within them, I found and tested my vocabulary and set of values. In my larger projects of the past 10 years, the contexts have varied greatly, ranging from virtually freestanding and autonomous buildings, uh, as in the case of, of the Athenaeum, to ones which had to be fitted very tightly into an urban fabric, such as the housing at Twin Parks in the Bronx, shown here. However, despite the disparity of scale and program, interrelated ideas about the basic dialogue between public and private space have emerged in all of these. In particular, the notion of architectural promenade spatial sequence, also a fundamentally urban conception, has been a constant in my work. Buildings are rarely completely isolated objects, and invariably, the context has played a major role 
in my designs. By context, I refer not only to physical environment, but to social, typological, and historical milieu. The two basic approaches which I explored in the project, previous project in Twin Parks were those of a, a figure, ground, and object texture, both which were direct responses with, to what is usually a very powerful context. But at the Bronx Developmental Center, shown here, the surroundings were powerful, but in a decidedly negative way. The triangular site in the Bronx occupies part of a blighted no man's land. It's a, it's a traffic island, which is bounded by the, uh, a parkway on one side and a network of railroad tracks on the other. It's isolated on an elongated rise within an otherwise flat and formless hospital campus. It, it has no defining features from which to derive a, a set of design propositions. So the new building could not be related to its context in a conventional way. I believe that in being sensitive to context and in seeking values in it, one must also know when to ignore it. And sometimes a decision to turn one's back on a negative context can become a positive gesture. And this is really what the strategy was here at the Bronx, to allow the new structure to create its own context, to, to mitigate the negative surrounds through the provision of a positive one. And so the complex opens inward to a, what one like to think uh, is, is an inviting reality, where the, the resident is shielded from this uh, somewhat hostile landscape. This is a, a, a total care facility for mentally handicapped people, and the Bronx Center is at one time, it's a school, it's a hospital, it's a home for people ranging in age from seven to 70. In our design, we, we try to create a sense of place that could respond to the special feelings and, and the, the real needs of, of these residents. In the Bronx, the program seemed in some ways akin to that of a monastery uh, because like the monastery, the Bronx Developmental Center is a kind of city in microcosm. It contains a sequence of specific social places, each with its distinctive formal qualities. So the complex has its own particular urban morphology, which addresses the nature of the program and certain architectural notions about sequence and form. Of course, the issue of typology is present in any work of architecture. My own attitude toward typology has to do with the use of history to identify principles of form, spatial organization, construction, and so on, which may be applied flexibly to analogous contemporary design problems. In this sense, the history of architecture becomes not so much a grab bag of borrowable images as a source of ideas and method. Here in the Bronx, there are three separate elements which make up the composition. And these are, are drawn together by various means of connective tissue. There's the support service wing, which you just saw, uh, which is the administrative functions and has this official public character and scale, and forms a vast wall, uh, a filter, through which the outside world must pass in order to, to gain the inner realms. And then there's the residential units shown here, which are in response to that hard, unyielding quality of the support services wing. And, and these are L-shaped and slept, step back slightly toward the north. And one might say that the, the residential buildings are of a more domestic scale, uh, uh, somewhat like interconnected houses. The third element is, is these courtyard spaces, which are, are vast external rooms, which are carved and sculpted into a kind of uh, uh, enchanted uh, terrain. They're private worlds, which function as a, a kind of three-dimensional playground, which offer alternate aspects, quiet, active, green and white, hard and soft. 
this terrain is articulated by a landfill that half conceals one side of the open space from the other. The surface of the building was treated as another opportunity to convey functional and conceptual ideas. The aluminum panel and glass curtain wall, which was developed here, was not only to modify and meet the specific light requirements of different sectors of, of the center, but the external skin was coded to express the system of organization. This elevational code was layered through the public to the more private areas of the residential units and then through and into the large sheltered courtyard spaces. The public realms, for instance, uh, the entry and dining hall and, and, and lecture hall uh, and gymnasium have this mullioned or, or vertically paneled curtain walls and appear more open and penetrable than the private ones, which have smaller openings and, and tauter walls. And this syntax is further defined by the location of the glass plane in relation to the surface, because in the public areas, it, it's set back from the face, and, and in the private areas, as you saw, it, it's a flush uh, 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 condition uh, with the skin of the building. So in this way, uh, the concept of a progression from public to private is further established through the nuance of surface detail. The design of the Bronx Developmental Center differentiated through a sequential transformation of type, texture, and circulation between the public zones of the street uh, and the administrative areas on one hand and the private zones of the courtyards and the residential units on the other. Uh, this uh, is the Athenaeum in New Harmony, Indiana. It offers a, a rather different conception, uh, a primary concern with architectural promenade. The Athenaeum is, is a public building. There are no private realms to unfold. In this case, the context played a, a much more direct and positive role in the shaping of the design. There were two very rich contexts to contend with. The immediate physical one of the rolling field of the site itself, and the more general historical one of the town of New Harmony. Historically, New Harmony was one of the important precedents in the search for an architecture that would mirror the evolution of society toward its own vision of harmony. The building, in its role as a visitor's orientation center, had to relate both to New Harmony's spiritual patrimony as well as, as to its modern students. It had to be at once a, a part of the town and yet separate from it. It had to be a, a threshold through which one passed in, in preparation and in anticipation. The site of the Athenaeum is in a field on the edge of the town along the banks of the Wabash River. And in the spring, when the field floods, the building, which is built on a podium of earth, floats above the water. Uh, some people might think of it as an object from another context and time, uh, a porcelain paneled boat of knowledge, if you will, docking on New Harmony's shores. And as you saw on a couple of the slides, New Harmony itself is a set piece, somewhat, I don't, I don't really like to say like Williamsburg, Virginia, because it's not with people walking around in costumes as, as in Williamsburg, but there is the idea of preservation 
of, of uh, the historical buildings which exist there. And New Harmony is a kind of phenomena of preservation. And therefore, the Athenaeum does not attempt to be like what surrounds it. It, it really addresses spirit, not literal substance. Uh, but it's also very much part of this spatial continuum leading from the water's edge to the center of the town. It is, in fact, both uh, the beginning and a, and a kind of distillation of the path that ultimately leads into the heart of the town and to the heart of the historical experience. Now, because the town these, these are out of order, I'm sorry. Uh, this is another building down the road from the Athenaeum, which is a pottery shape. I'll come back to this. Uh, uh, because the town can be approached as both a, a contemporary place as well as a historical event, the building is conceived in terms of the linked ideas of architectural promenade as well as historical path. And as the town's actual as well as symbolic link with the water and therefore the outside world. Uh, the building is a place of arrival. It, it's like a, a giant portal. And so the visitor who arrives by boat, uh, which is rare these days but will happen again, uh, is deposited on a path that leads up through the field to the building. And on reaching the podium, the water route is joined by its landed counterpart, which is uh, uh, the entrance from, from the parking lot. And here, there's a the three-story plane, uh, which is set at a 40-degree angle from the predominant orthogonal grid of the building in order to acknowledge the real point of arrival. And it conveys the visitor to the actual portal, the, the doorway, which is shifted five degrees in orientation in order to announce the primary grid of the building. And meanwhile, this many-sided facade of the building also gestures to aspects of the landscape. For example, this section of wall, uh, which is oriented to the, to the river, is a curved and fluid ribbon of glass that one might say speaks of the, of the water form. Now, once the visitor has uh, crossed the threshold and gone through the entry box, uh, he, he is at a space which is at the foot of the internal circulation ramp. And as I've said, circulation is the main spatial protagonist of this building, and the ramp is its most vital element. And as this ramp winds upward from the orthogonal grid, uh, uh, the, uh, it regains the five degree offset orientation of the path from the river. And there is a certain amount of motion uh, that is uh, created by this. And this geometry of overlaid grids induces a compression of spaces at certain points and a tension at others. When the outside ramp, which extends along the south elevation, approaches the interior ramp perpendicularly, this this five-degree shift makes itself particularly felt because there's one circulation path is inflected toward another. It's a, a kind of forcing a visual perception of spaces narrowing and then opening of, of grids almost colliding. And this collision, one might say, uh, kind of resonates throughout. Uh, but the ramp, which straddles the space in which all of these geometries come together and which is illuminated uh, by light from above, resolves uh, both of these grids, both in plan and in section. That ramp then arrives at the second level at the exhibition space, which contains the, the model of uh, Old New Harmony. And from here, there are framed views to the exterior, which serve as orienting devices, which operate between the building and the town that it serves. Now, aside from the major ramp, there are many itineraries within the building for historical and architectural exploration in this building. And these are sometimes uh, 
demarcated by skylights, by shifting wall planes, and by the changing ceiling and floor heights. Upon reaching the exhibition space on the third level, the visitor then can look back through the internal route that he's traveled and through a series of slots and windows. Uh, and he can also look forward to uh, the route that he is about uh, to, to take uh, onto the rooftop terraces. And from here, uh, the visitor then moves onto the rooftop uh, uh, and looks out to the landscape and then also back uh, at the top uh, to the town uh, uh, which the building serves. The landscape is, in fact, very much a part of this building. At the uppermost roof terrace, the visitor finds himself confronted with the town. And this small space uh, offers a, a kind of panoramic view, as if from the prow of a ship it's both a culmination and an, an anticipation. It's like a widow's walk, and it, it holds vigil over the town. And it, it also reinforces the actual and the ideological axis that joins the restored harmonist log cabins, the, the uh, pottery shed, Phillips Johnson's roofless church, uh, and the commemorative garden built in uh, Paul Tillich's honor. The long step ramp then leads the visitor out of the building and toward New Harmony, uh, a kind of uh, dynamic manifestation of the building's relationship to the town. Now, shortly uh, after uh, working uh, uh, on this building uh, for good period of time, we were asked uh, to do a, quite a different kind of, of, of building uh, in Hartford, Connecticut. This is the Hartford Seminary, uh, and uh, it gave, uh, the seminary gave up its role as a, a traditional residential divinity school uh, for the ministry and, and established itself as an interdenominational uh, uh, theological seminary. And due to its changing needs, the seminary decided to sell uh, I its old buildings to the University of Connecticut Law School and to build instead a, a smaller uh, new structure that would include all of its programs. And at the same time, project an, a new image uh, of scholarship and commitment. Uh, the architectural program included a, a large meeting hall, a chapel, a library, uh, uh, and a bookstore, as well as classrooms and, and faculty spaces. The immediate physical context is that of a, a, a rather residential suburban campus. It's made up of loosely knit blocks of stone academic buildings uh, of the uh, old neo-Gothic seminary, which is across the street. Uh, and there's also, here and there, a mixture of neo-Tudor and neo-colonial houses. And so the building uh, occupies this rather flat uh, uh, corner site. Because of the seminary's dual role as a private institution, which is devoted to encouraging contemplation and scholarship, and its public one devoted to encouraging religious understanding in the world at large, uh, the building is really conceived of in two ways. Uh, on one hand, it's a partially cloistered, uh, inward-looking organization of spaces, a, a contemplative place for gathering and study. And on the other hand, it's intended to be perhaps the center of a larger domain which reaches out to the public and informs it and invites it to take part. I must have pressed the wrong button. Uh, uh, 
as you can uh, the in keeping with the uh, democratic principles upon which the seminary is based the only hierarchy in this building is really an architectural one and, and that's because public spaces dominate over private ones and among the, the private spaces there there is no hierarchical uh, distinction made uh, the public spaces are, are organized sequentially uh, as the institutions need to provide a transition from the worldly and mundane to the ordered intellectual and spiritual life within was an opportunity also to explore notions of architectural sequence and promenade. Uh, the, as, you, as you saw in some of the earlier uh, slides, the seminary is entered through this kind of cloistered space which the, the building surrounds on two sides. It's a kind of gateway on axis with the entry and suggests a ritual passage, a processional way into a sanctuary. Uh, it's at once perhaps a, an inviting gesture to visitors and a remnant uh, also perhaps a, a, of a, a medieval cloister. Uh, a preparation for the interior and an adjustment to the spiritual, both communal and contemplative within. Now, as this seminary encourages understanding and participation, so the building occupies the same by means of this projection and penetration from the interior to exterior space. And this occurs both in plan and in section. The elemental notion uh, emanating the entire building was the belief that a house of worship, community, and scholarship is fundamentally a coming together in light, uh, as a quote from Luke Kahn. Uh, and the building is intended to be a luminous presence inside and out, uh, an actual and symbolic place of intellectual and, and spiritual enlightenment. Uh, these are model photographs of the Frankfurt Museum which is now under construction. I believe <clears throat> that the city, like smaller works of architecture, primarily consists of public and private spaces and the spaces in between. But unlike architectural works of lesser scale and complexity, the urban design and particularly in European cities, the urban design contains the dynamic of history. It's a given for the architect, uh, a, veritable, a veritable confrontation. The city reinforces the historical spatial dialogue. In the Museum for Kunsthandwerk here in Frankfurt, the attempt is made to make this dialogue highly articulate. Here the notion of context is expanded to take in not only physical and programmatic concerns, but also the respective historical context of site and building type. And indeed, the parti developed from an intense response to this combined context. And the basic form was determined largely by the structure of the city itself. This scheme not only responds to, but it intensifies it, it enlarges it, reinforces the public context and the urban fabric. Uh, here, uh, a building and an urban form are one. The existing villa a neoclassical Villa Metzler, which is on the left, on the left-hand slide, slide uh, is a stately relic from the age of Goethe and, and Schenkel, and it has contain the city's decorative art treasure since the end of World War II. It is one of eight museums on the south bank of the mine, uh, which overlooks the center of the city. And this three-story stucco mansion, which is again on the left of, the, of both slides, <coughs> uh, 
uh, and which was built in 1803, provides insufficient gallery space for an extensive collection of European and non-Western decorative art. The extension to the villa, the new building, is roughly nine times the size of the present museum. Besides preserving and connecting to the villa, the museum extension relates to all of the neighboring museums along this continuous riverside embankment. It's conceived of as, a, as an urban bridge, a pedestrian link between the resi residential quarter of Sachsenhausen, which is to the south, and the commercial district, which is across the Main River. The hip-roofed Villa Metzler occupies one corner uh, of the open courtyard and is to be connected by a glass-walled bridge to uh, the new structure. The new building is massed as a cluster. I'm sorry, I, 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 this is an aside. Let, let me talk about, I forgot about these. Uh, uh, this gets a little uh, out of order here, but this is the renovation uh, uh, of the Villa Strozzi in Florence in, in, in 1973. And it's here because it also addresses the problem uh, of integrating the old and the new. Uh, here in Florence, however, uh, the approach was just the reverse uh, of that in Frankfurt, because here uh, we left uh, two walls of the old shell of the building and in, enclosed a, a, and the new museum is inserted into uh, this shell. Uh, the old building forms an enclosure for the new one so that the 19th century stable buildings uh, of, of the uh, Villa Strozzi uh, become, becomes a, a kind of shell that uh, encases uh, uh, this modern uh, uh, building. Uh, these are the mo model photographs. Nothing went further than, than, than this. None of the projects of the Villa Strozzi uh, were realized. Here, back in Frankfurt, uh, then the opposite takes place because here we've taken the elementary uh, 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 proportions of the villa plan and the orthogonal pattern of its facades and we've repeated them as modules at, er at nearly every level of the design. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, I'll go just go through these uh, uh, diagrams very quickly because I think they help in understanding the, the, the scheme. Uh, the, the new structure, as I said, replicates and projects the geometry uh, of the Villa Metzler's basic cubic dimensions at several scales so that the villa's 17.6 meter width and height uh, become the basis for the exterior dimensions of, of each quadrant and the elevational proportions of the villa become the source of the proportions for all of the exposed surfaces uh, uh, of the new building, such as the windows, the skylights, the wall panels, the paving blocks, et cetera. Uh, at the same time, that's the, the projection of the geometry of the villa. There's also an acknowledgement of the uh, building's relationship to the different orientation of its neighbors on the other sides. And this uh, is expressed by the rotation uh, of this basic square plan, three and a half degrees, to align with the facades uh, of the other buildings along the Scheimein Kai, the, the, the river embankment. And this shift in axis by the same measure, by the same uh, three and a half degrees, uh, and in that way, we establish a frontal relationship with all of the other existing buildings on the river embankment. Now, this shift uh, then introduces a, a kind of subtle diagonal tension within the original grid. And this overlaying of grids allows a, rec a reconciliation of, of, uh, between the site vectors and the formal organization of the building. So within the plan of the complex itself, uh, this displacement the major axis causes an inflection 
towards the entrance uh, and, and also uh, towards the park. <clears throat> the pedestrian route, which then comes through the building, intersects with others in this kind of miniature public square uh, whose form is determined by uh, the fragmentation of the original grid of the, uh, of the building and, and by the creation of the open courtyard, which is based uh, on the diagonal one. And the square plan uh, of the courtyard then also echoes the square plan of the villa and also of the complex as a whole. It also happens that it allows all the existing trees on the site to be preserved, uh, which was a, 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 an important criteria. And, and, it, and it also provides for a transition between the, the more private life of the residential community of Sachsenhausen uh, on one side with the more public life uh, of uh, the center uh, of the town uh, on the other. <coughs> Now, since the building is, is under construction, uh, and I only have these model photographs to show you, I insert another aside. And this is, is just a way uh, also of showing you that the concept for the interior organization of the museum in, in Frankfurt is in some ways similar to an installation which we did uh, in 1977 for a, a show of New York School of painters and sculptors. And at that time, in seeking ways to make exhibited objects, some of which were huge in scale, in seeking ways to make them visible, we felt that the ideal point of view was, in fact, not always singular, but, but multiple. And in general, the most desirable way uh, to see a work of art is close up and then to move away and then to see it again from a distance, uh, uh, also allowing one to savor an unexpected glimpse back at objects already seen, or perhaps to have previews uh, of, of uh, seeing objects uh, yet to come. Now, That was an interior. So back to Frankfurt here, uh, it is thought that the architecture will in fact help to conduct the visitor through uh, a prescribed didactic and evocative sequence uh, uh, which is arranged chronologically and is uh, geographical, uh, geographically organized uh, as a kind of uh, Bedecker of the visual of the decorative arts. And instead of assembling period rooms, uh, the surroundings uh, will be then, in fact, congenial in spirit to the nature uh, of each object. And at Frankfurt, there will be interior windows and, and circulation routes through the galleries, uh, positioned so that exhibitions uh, are sometimes perceived obliquely, partially, or from a distance. Now, during the uh, Age of Enlightenment, the museum as a building type came to have an educational as well as collection and display function. And uh, the, build the museum at Frankfurt, as well as hopefully uh, this new museum in Atlanta, Georgia, uh, uh, are in uh, this tradition uh, uh, that they both contribute to uh, the museum's educational uh, uh, role uh, and are intended to provide a, an ambience conducive both to viewers' contemplative moments uh, and to their immediate appreciation and discovery uh, of a collection's uh, aesthetic values. It, the High Museum of Art, shown here again in model, uh, uh, 
also refers to the typological tradition uh, of the Enlightenment and attempts to resolve uh, some of the old and modern notions of the art museum. The design of the, the High Museum uh, developed as a series of architectonic response to context in, in the broadest sense, uh, understood to include not only the functional, the programmatic, and typological concerns, but also the physical, social, and historical context of, of the city. And the importance of, of the site here to Atlanta's future development, the pedestrian-oriented character of this neighborhood, and the role of the museum as an urban and cultural symbol, and the self-consciously progressive tradition of the city of Atlanta, uh, all profoundly uh, influenced the design. Because uh, this corner of the site, which is adjacent to a horrendous uh, uh, Memorial Arts Center, uh, 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 is uh, on Peachtree Street, and uh, because the pedestrian traffic patterns seem to dictate, the, the entry is, is in a sense carved uh, out of the building. Uh, and in this way, a priority of direction is established uh, on the diagonal bisection of, of an otherwise uh, square plan. The entry ramp, uh, one might say, reaches out to the city so that the initiation into the realm of art begins at, at the street. And uh, it becomes a, a slow, almost ceremonial promenade uh, uh, in preparation for, for viewing the art within. Uh, here, the auditorium is treated as a separate building, but both for recess, uh, reasons of access and security, and by its location, in relation to the basic cubic volume of the main building, it reinforces the entry and becomes part of this processional sequence. Now, in some ways, uh, the building might be seen as a commentary on the Guggenheim Museum because the circulation and gallery spaces enclose the center space. And this central space is the beginning and, and really the reference point of movement within the building. Now, the marvel of the Guggenheim Museum is that the vertical movement provides a continual reference, not only to the central space, which is filled with light, but also uh, to the art uh, itself. And the visitor is confronted in a multitude of ways uh, of viewing the art. But, and, and also at the Guggenheim, the end of any particular, from the end of any particular exhibition, you can also see the beginning. The central problem at the Guggenheim, however, is that the ramp as gallery induces a propelling motion uh, that uh, is appropriate to the contemplation of, of works of art and the sloping ceilings and the sloping floors and the sloping walls are not only uncomfortable, but render uh, the display of paintings especially difficult. So at Atlanta, we've attempted to reinterpret the particular virtues of the Guggenheim by the manner in which we've separated the vertical circulation of the interior ramp and the gallery space and spaces, we've been able to maintain the idea of continual reference to the central space filled with light. Uh, in addition, the galleries are organized to offer multiple vi vistas and cross-references and to permit a museum experience that is at once intimate uh, as well as relating uh, to the historical uh, uh, sequence so that exhibition spaces are arranged in such a manner uh, that one can look across the atrium from one gallery to another. And in this way, it's then possible to see a work of art close up 
and then coming around on the ramp to see it again from a different perspective. And so visitors will have, in addition to the changing perspectives of the objects, a full panorama of internal circulation and views into the atrium as well as to the out of doors. Apart from its purely functional role, light in this building is a constant preoccupation and also a symbol of the museum's purpose. Light is, is in fact basic to the architectural conception because the museum is meant to be both metaphysically uh, and physically radiant. Uh, it's, it's intended both to contain and to reflect light, and in this way, perhaps to express the museum's purpose as a place of enlightenment and as the center of the city's cultural life. Uh, I have uh, a, a number of slides which I'm going to quickly uh, on a project which we have begun working on, but which has uh, been stopped. And so uh, I'm just going to describe it very, very briefly, uh, rather than, uh, and just almost in terms It's, it's, a, it's a project in Paris uh, for Renault. It's the new administrative headquarters. It was to have been. It won't, uh, it, it won't be built uh, because of the economic crisis in France. It was to have been the new administrative headquarters building for Renault and is uh, part of, an coor uh, of a coordinated urban design and, and architectural scheme which incorporates existing office buildings uh, and aspects uh, of the site, such as the adjacent bank of the Seine, and also the texture of the city of, of Paris uh, in the organization of, of this uh, future building, or now not future building. Uh, and it was, it was designed uh, <coughs> to be both sympathetic and uh, a, a respectful complement to problematic existing building, and also uh, a part of, of a total uh, uh, tw uh, 20th century complex. So the uh, organizational uh, uh, gr grid of this, as, as it were, is really uh, derived in part from the, uh, and I, I don't even have the drawings here, that's why I want to go, I'm sorry, the, the slides weren't made in time. Uh, of the, uh, to show that the building is related both uh, to the existing complex on the site, of, which is the headquarters buildings for Renault, as well as the grid of the city of Paris. And so there's this, uh, in this case, 24 degree shift uh, <laughs> that uh, in order to allow the building both to be on perpendicular to the Seine River, as well as relate to the city of Paris. <coughs> Uh, so, the, the uh, deflected or, or uh, rotated grid, is, as I said, is really uh, uh, generated uh, in response to the, to the Paris texture, uh, and it aligns very much with the, with the uh, bank of the Seine, which is at the edge of the site. Uh, elements of, of the new building uh, are located on the site responding directly to and orienting directly to uh, the existing buildings and closing an outdoor urban space while supporting the functional organization uh, of the uh, existing buildings. And here in the plans, I think that you can see that, that quite clearly. At the bottom is that shift which responds to the, the three existing headquarters buildings. And the site is a very, very tight one, which is now a, a, a big parking lot. And this is, and so the, the, the problem of giving every office, which had to be of exactly the same size and dimension, an equal amount of, of light and air so that every office either looks into the courtyard or out to the Seine or out to the, to the city of Paris. Uh, the 
scale uh, of the building uh, also derives from the existing buildings on the site, uh, as well as from the texture and, and the richness of all of the uh, buildings in the city. And at the same time, there is a, a variety of spaces, a, a variety of scales, and a variety of, of, of views, while there is an attempt to maintain a clear relationship of the architectural parts so that the visitors, as well as the employees, always retain their orientation. And, uh, one knows always where he or she is. <clears throat> Uh, the, the plan organization of the typical office floor revolves around these three large courtyard spaces and every, from every office, uh, uh, one, as I said, has a, a view uh, to the outside world, whether it's into the courtyards or out into the city. And one has always experienced a, a different perspective, different view. The, the concerns which are expressed in the design of this building are, are also uh, uh, related to, to previous concerns with, with sociological, environmental, and, and organizational problems, which uh, I think we all regard as being paramount to the evolution of any design. Uh, each building has its own hierarchy, which is often indicated by the, the program and the site. Uh, and the, the building then evolves from a broad but uh, rather complex uh, understanding uh, of these ordering principles. The essential urban dialogue takes place between type and incident, between public and private, between fabric and discontinuity, between history and the present moment. It's a dialogue that exists at every scale. I believe it's possible to see all of my work as a sequence of investigations into the spatial interchange between public and private realms. This interchange expresses itself in varying conceptions, but is always related in some way to a notion of architectural promenade to an idea of passage. Finally, and again, mine is an attempt to find and redefine a sense of order, to understand then a relationship between what has been and what can be, to extract from our culture both the timeless and the topical. This, to me, is the basis of style, the decision to include or exclude choice, the final exercise of the individual will and intellect. In this way, my style is something that is born out of culture and yet is profoundly connected with personal experience. But to gain any sense of my involvement, it's necessary to consult my work. Fundamentally, my meditations are on space, form, light, and how to make them. My goal is presence, not illusion. I pursue it with unrelenting vigor I believe it is the heart and the soul of architecture. Thank you.
sincere uh, and rational description of your process. Uh, the last time Alvin asked me to do this, it was for uh, John Hayjuk, uh, also a New Yorker, and I commented that he and I kept meeting and bumping into each other in tight places and restricted spaces. Uh, he's twice as tall as me, uh, if not twice as wide. Uh, but with Richard, it's different. I know well his office uh, and his apartment in New York, where I frequently stayed, and all is spaciousness and light. He doesn't live surrounded by the eclectic clutter uh, which some of us do. He lives, <coughs> he lives in the manner that he preaches, with pristine walls and a minimum of functional objects though there are many books and also some small abstract collages uh, which he makes and which are very elegant. Uh, thus, as a person and as an architect, uh, he's all of a piece and he represents the pure and revolutionary strain of the modern movement. And probably, rare progress can only be made by the true believer. It therefore gives me great pleasure to move the vote of thanks for the 1982 John Dennis Memorial Lecture and thank Richard Meyer for doing it.